Amen. Well, I tell you, when we the songs we sang today uh, are certainly representative of of why we meet on Sunday. Uh, why do we meet on Sundays? No, why 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 Sunday? Why this day? Because the Lord rose. All right. So we 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 set aside this day uh, as the Lord's day uh, to commemorate. Uh, Jesus Christ coming out of that grave, uh, you know, taking the keys uh, to death, hell, and the grave. There isn't a, a sting of death and, uh, and all of that stuff anymore. And we meet uh, on Sunday because we realize that this life isn't all that we have to look forward to. That there is more uh, later. And it's because he rose and that he lives today, as the song says, that this life is worth the living. Amen. Uh, so, you know, uh, I appreciate uh, the, the, the song service that gets us prepared uh, for what God has. And, you know, as I say in your notes, over the past several decades, uh, as we've looked around, and, and those of you who've been around for a while, you've seen a decline in, in church attendance. Uh, and other metrics of Christian engagement, such as, you know, Bible reading and praying and uh, extracurricular type things that may go on uh, in the church. We've just seen less and less people seem to participate uh, in those types of things. Uh, you also look around, and certainly this is true uh, for our country, and I think it in the broader world as well, that there's been a decline in moral standards and, and some people go, yeah, there's been a decline in moral standards. That's not true. There has not been a decline in moral standards. There has always been immorality and some very bad immorality even in the biblical times. The problem is that this decline in moral standards is being accepted by more and more people as the normal way to operate. All right, That is different. It used to be that you'd have immorality, maybe a, a country that would have some problems, uh, but that would not have been as broadly accepted around the world. Um, when you put those two things together, the decline in Christian engagement and the acceptance of moral uh, decay by the masses, uh, then you could conclude that you would be observing a decline in quote-unquote Christianity. And we've, sat, we've talked about that. We, we've looked at statistics before and we've said, well, it seems that Christianity is on the decline. But the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, they have a report every year that they publish and it's entitled The Status of Global Christianity. Um, and what they concluded in 2019 was this. Globally, Christianity is growing at a 1.27% rate. Currently, there are 2.5 billion Christians in the world. The world's population is 7.7 .7 billion, and it's growing at a rate of 1.20%. So Christianity is growing by 0.07 more than the population of the world is going up. If you look at other faiths like Islam, it's growing at 1.95%. It is the fastest growing religion currently. Uh, then you have the Sikhs at 1.66%, Hindus at 1.3%, and those are the only three religious groups that are growing faster than Christianity. But when you look at the followers of Jesus Christ, globally speaking, there are very much more of us than there are of those people. And they predict, and it's, if you look at different studies, it's predicted that Christians will outnumber other faiths at least by the year 2050, and some say by the, by the year 2060. Now, at that point, because the others are growing faster, they're predicting that probably Islam will overtake the United States, I mean, overtake uh, Christianity. Uh, may overtake, if you've been in Jim's Bible study, uh, probably overtake, uh, Christ, uh, overtake Christianity by, by around, you know, uh, uh, 2060 or something like that. That's a projection, who, who in the world knows, uh, but that's the way the numbers uh, are sitting there uh, looking. Uh, if you look at this report, you can plainly tell that Christianity is not declining. 
It's actually growing. And as I said, growing faster than the rate of growth in the, uh, in the world. The reason for that is Christians have uh, more children than, than per person than other people have uh, in, other, in other faiths. I think, it, I think the number's 2.7. I don't know how you have 2.7 children, but I just rounded it up to three. <laughs> Me and Brooke did, so uh, we skipped the 2.7 thing. Uh, but Christians having more children, that's why it's growing uh, faster than the world population. But uh, according to the same report, uh, you can uh, take a look at the number of unevangelized people. So Christianity is still growing, even as of 2019, by 1.27%. Uh, and this is during a time where the unevangelized, those people who had not heard the gospel yet, uh, has decreased rapidly. In 1900, 54.3% of the world was unevangelized for Jesus Christ. In 2019, that number dropped to 284 So there was a almost half, we cut it in half, uh, again, of the world. So just a little more than one quarter of this planet is unevangelized for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now that still, that 28.4%, it still represents about 2.2 billion people on the planet that have not heard the message of Jesus Christ or is not having some form of active evangelism. So looking at all of that stuff, I have a bold question in your notes. So if Christianity is growing, why do we feel like it is declining? And of course, with notes, you had the answer under, under there. And I'm just going to give you a possible answer. Uh, the answer may be that Christianity is growing because it is adding more and more carnal or worldly Christians to its ranks. So that leads us to the question for this morning. What is a carnal or worldly Christian. What are these things? You've, if you've uh, been around church a while, you've probably heard of carnal uh, Christians before, but we're going to explore it this morning. We uh, look at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, where Paul says, uh, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Uh, when you take a look at verse 1, the NIV translates uh, here worldly. Uh, if you take a look at that in the King James Version, uh, then that will say carnal. So which is why we use the English word uh, carnal Christian sometimes. Uh, that same word, if you look at it in the New American Standard Version uh, of the Bible, uh, then NASB, that is used, uh, it's translated as flesh, all right, flesh. And the reason for this is that the Greek word that is there is sarakikos, and it means having the nature of flesh. So if you think about that, some sensual feeling, controlled by animal appetites, governed by human nature instead of by the Spirit of God, all right? So that's why these versions will say, you know, if you said carnal, that's not in most people's uh, vernacular today to use that word, and that's why most other translations have went to say flesh now, but I think even people today uh, are not understanding even what the flesh part means they think flesh is okay because if you're a humanist, and I said something about this in a prior message, humanists believe uh, that everything uh, has to do with us. So our flesh is not bad, our flesh is good, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Worldly uh, typically distinguishes from the spiritual. And that's why the NIV has, has translated this verse in this way uh, to say, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. And then it goes on to say mere infants in Christ. Uh, so Paul is talking here to the Corinthian church, uh, and he's reminding them in, in verse 1 of when he was there teaching them before. He, he was reminding them that at that point, uh, he could not uh, talk, talk to them as spiritual people. 
um, but as worldly as mere infants in Christ. So what does that mean, mere infants in Christ? They were what? Baby Christians. They were immature. All right. Uh, if you take a look at the time frame of when Corinthians was, 1 Corinthians was written, it was written somewhere around 55 A.D., uh, Paul had actually went to Corinth uh, during the end of his second missionary journey. He had three, and he went on the end of his second missionary journey to Corinth, uh, and that was somewhere in the ballpark uh, of, of about 50 uh, A.D., give or take a few years uh, of exactly when he was at Corinth. There was five years difference between when he had started the church at Corinth and when he's writing this letter uh, at the end of his third missionary journey to them, having heard about some problems that the church at Corinth uh, was having. And so he's reminded them, hey, you remember five years ago, I was talking to y'all this way because you were mere infants in Christ. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for it. But the charge now, even five years later, 60 months later, he says, indeed, you're still not ready. So what's he saying? They're still babies. They're still infants in Christ. He says, you are still worldly. The New American Standard says you're still fleshly. I don't know how to say that, really. Um, but you're still fleshly. Uh, you, you still are worldly. You still are carnal, all right? You still are dealing with the flesh and the things of this world, not surrendering, as the definition uh, told us at the end, that you're, that you're governed by human nature instead of by the Spirit of God. He says, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Now, I want you to take a look at a couple of things. He has charged these people with being immature. He has charged them with being worldly. He's charged them with not being spiritual, right? Would almost conclude for you that he's talking to non-Christians. But that is not true. Look at verse 1. Well, how does he address them? He says, brothers. You don't say brothers, brethren, unless you are talking about people that are saved, that are Christians. Even at that, he says at the end that he was speaking to them as mere infants what? To be in Christ doesn't mean to be out of Christ, does it? He is talking to Christians. Make no mistake about it. He is writing this letter to the Corinthian church made up of Christian people. Some people have said, well, maybe he's not talking to Christians. Maybe he's talking to unsaved people. You would have to be crazy to think that he's writing any of the letters from, from Corinth to any of them to writing them to non-Christians. You can be scathing in your rebuke to people and, 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 and be talking to Christian folks. He is, he is unequivocally talking to Christians. There may be unsaved people. In the church at Corinth, he isn't addressing them. He's addressing the brothers that are immature. And they were immature five years ago, and they were still immature today. All right, so just want to make sure we dispel that. And again, he had heard about some problems. People had reported back to him over the course of these years about the problem in Corinth. Corinth was a big city. It was an important city. A lot of things were happening. You could think of that like as a Chicago or L.A. or New York or something like that for us in a, uh, in a city in the United States. Big, important places uh, that you hear about. Corinth was that way in Greece, uh, and, and, and they, he got these reports back with all the problems they were having, jealousy, divisiveness, sexual immorality, failure to discipline some of its members. They had all of these questions, and so Paul wrote the book of Corinthians uh, to take care of those divisions uh, and the problems that were happening and to answer a bunch of questions. It's a fabulous book. Uh, but even though these are carnal or worldly people, they are still Christians that are in need of discipleship. When Paul left, they had not, if, if you're going to have sanctification, uh, which is the process by which we become more and more like Christ, say one is the worst, you're a baby in 10, you've reached the best you could ever get. When Paul left Corinth, they were not all out of 10. Do you realize that? Are you a 10? Am I? 
So again, these were people that had problems, but they still, they still needed to be worked on. They were still needing to be uh, taken care of. So a Christian can be carnal, though, for a period, but a true Christian will, will not remain carnal for a lifetime. And I think that's what's going to start as you think about what is a carnal Christian. Paul was addressing the Corinthians as if they were mature, but didn't he have an expectation there? Didn't it sound like he was wanting them to have been mature? He wasn't going, oh, y'all were immature. Yay! Wonderful. Was he? He was kind of talking about this in a way uh, that, that was not a good thing. Uh, he wanted them to mature at some point. Some people have taken the idea of carnal Christian. They've used this word carnal Christian, worldly Christian, fleshly Christian, whatever. And they have tried to say that that's okay. They said it's possible for people to come to faith in Christ and then proceed to live the rest of their lives in a completely carnal manner with no evidence of being born again or a new creation. It's okay, you just get saved and live like hell. That's all right. Is that okay? Hey, don't, don't, I, I don't know, maybe it is. I don't know, let's see what the Bible says. What did Paul himself say in the next letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. So what's that mean? When you, when you get saved, you're supposed to put off the former things. You're supposed to let it go. However, that is true, but do you put off all the former things instantaneously? Huh. I think some people have an expectation that you did. You become instantaneously level 10. Yeah, that's what you do, right? Huh? Well, y'all just speaking from personal experience, but that's what, that's what good people do, right? See, that's one of the issues in teaching about this is you got to be really careful, okay, and not saying what he's not saying or not hearing what he's not saying not reading what he's not saying, is that he's never said here in, in, in uh, Corinthians uh, 3, 1 through 3, that it was okay. And there is that idea that in this world that you can become a Christian and live like hell and still be a Christian. And you know what the answer is to that? If somebody asked me, can I be a Christian and still live like hell? I would say, yes, it depends. It's not a yes or no question. You can answer that yes or no. And you say, sure I can. No, you cannot be a Christian and live like hell. Oh, 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 oh. But then you can say that a person that was over here uh, that is obviously sinning, you can say, oh, no, they're, they're still a Christian because, you know, they, they're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and, and they've repented, but they sinned in their life. And, you know, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you will start making excuses that, well, that person did sin, but, you know, there's a difference between sinning and living in sin. You start having to do all of these types of things like a contortionist to try to get out of the fact that we as Christians remain sinners even as we are saved. Romans 5, 8 says that, 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 that Christ, that God, loved us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, when he died for us, that did not mean that we instantaneously became perfect. If you were perfect here, raise your hand. If you were sinless, raise your hand. Sinless? You have no sin. Oh, Miss, Miss Virginia, she speaks highly of herself. Uh, she smiled. Um, there's scripture, of course, that talks about that in John, that if you think, that, basically Corey's version of that would say, if you think that you are sinless, then you've lost your mind. Um, it's not exactly the way it reads, but the spirit of it. Uh, if, a per if a person uh, remains, uh, uh, 
But let's, let, let me just look at this. Can a Christian in a time of failure or rebellion appear to be carnal? Can a Christian who backslides appear like they are carnal? Okay. Uh, will a true Christian remain carnal? Okay. So if a person remains carnal, the question is, was the person truly saved in the first place? Okay, that's the question. It's, it's if, you know, you, you said, okay, a person uh, that can appear to be carnal because they have messed up, right? So it appears like they're fleshly. It appears like they're worldly, but they can still be a Christian. But you're saying, though, that a person can, that remains in a carnal way, would not be a true Christian. But what constitutes remaining fleshly? And I know, right, when I said that, two or three people, and I've looked at a couple of people in the face, I know they're out, they went, oh, and they could have spit out an answer to me. And for every answer that you give me, I will push back at you about it. I'll tell you how you would also say that over here, that would look different. This is a very difficult question. And what does it mean to remain in a sin? What does it mean to live in a sin? You, mean, you say, well, to live in a sin is that I do it all the time. So the fact that you probably, you know, break a law at some point, whether that be speeding or not paying enough in taxes or whatever the case may be, does that mean that you're living in that kind of a sin uh, and the things that you may, you may do? Is it knowing it? Uh, uh, what is it? What is it? I know what I think the answer is. But this is a question that is, you know why it's hard for us? Because it's not our place. It's not our place to know whether somebody really is saved or not. Your brain can't grasp it. You can't grasp how a person could be. You can't grasp how Adolf Hitler could have done all the things he did. And right before he died, he could have surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, asked for repentance, and went to heaven. Your eye brains cannot fathom how God loves us that much. You also can't fathom how a person can be as good as gold in, this, in, this wor wor in the world that we're in, give all this money to children's orphanages and, and all of these good causes and be a really good person and, and they didn't cuss or smoke or drink or any of the things that, do, that the world does and they could bust hell wide open when they die. Your brain can't understand that. You know why? It's not our business. God says, one plant's. One waters, he brings the increase. Jesus himself said, I came uh, to, not to condemn, right? But to give my life as a ransom for many. That's his job, that's their job for condemnation. It is not our job. Our job is to examine, okay? So, as Paul said, now I may look at your life and you may look at mine and we may see certain things that indicate to us that you are living in a fleshly way. And some of those things are blatant, okay? They're really out there. You are living out, out of wedlock with somebody, having sex outside of marriage, having three or four different kids, uh, you know, with, with all these different people you, and all this kind of stuff, that is a blatant sin, right? Me standing up here lying to you all the time is a blatant sin. Me going and sleeping with several different other women while I am married is a blatant sin. If you found out about it, you could come up to me and say, hey, it appears that you were living carnally. Right? If you are homosexual, it would appear to me, according to the scripture, that you would be living in a worldly or carnal manner. Right? And I just listed a lot of other things before I got to that hot button issue. Okay? Adultery, any of the other lies, any, eating mu too much, whatever the case may be, all of those types of sins that are out there. There are indications for us to examine one another and to go up and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I think you may have a problem. That's what Paul was doing. 
Look at verse 1 of Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3. He says, brothers, he's wanting to shake them. He's talking to them. He's trying to get them to understand where they are. Uh, he's, he's addressing them. He, 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 but if you, look at, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the scripture in 1 John, let's look at 1 John 2.19. When I was talking about how you just don't know, you don't know. It says, they went out from us, but what? They did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Hmm. Now you read that in its context, okay? And I pulled that scripture out, and you can certainly read the entire chapter of 1 John chapter 2. But the point is, just because somebody's sitting in this church today, amen, writing on their notes or whatever, maybe they were up here singing, maybe they are up here preaching, just because we're present here today and we've clocked in in our professional Christian manner does not mean that you belong to the group in and of itself. There are many people that sit inside of the churches that go along uh, with this scripture and they, that says they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. And that's the question that you have to look at uh, when you're talking about this carnal Christian, this worldly Christian. You know, can a person be a carnal Christian? Is that a real thing? I think you have to say, yes, that is a real thing because Paul was addressing Christians. So it is, it is a fact that a person can be a worldly Christian. It is how long that person can be a worldly Christian. Is how long is that maturity phase? How long is that sanctification phase? What, what step are they on in the process of sanctification? And you know what? We don't know that. We don't know the answer to where they are. We think we may know. But how many times have you looked at a person and say, oh man, that, that's a good person. That person right there is bound for heaven. And then you find out who they really are. Think about all those priests. A lot of them young choir boys thought them priests were really, really good folk until they molested them. A lot of people thought their pastors were really good folk until they seen them off with another woman somewhere. You don't know. You don't know me, and I don't know you. But God does. And he was the one that knows the very thoughts in our mind. And thank God, the one that really knows us is the one that makes the decision. Okay? And not, the, and not, and not those of us uh, that may think. A Christian who behaves in a carnal or worldly way can expect God to lovingly, and I had to add that word, you know, it just makes it sound better, but lovingly discipline them. If you don't think he will not tear your tail up, you have not been a Christian long. And, uh, and I just pulled out one verse, but really all of Hebrews 12 is really good about this. Um, uh, Hebrews 12, 10, our fathers discipline us for a little while as, though, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Okay, Why does God discipline you? Because he wants you to do better. So being a carnal Christian and that idea that you remain worldly, that you remain in a circumstance to where you're looking at more of the fleshly desires than you're looking at God, to remain that way would mean that you are getting your tail whipped by God all the time and saying, I'm going to continue to do that. You're going to be directly disobedient to God himself. Does that sound like a Christian? I don't think so. And God's not going to just let you go off over there without any form of discipline whatsoever. He's going to be active in your life, and that's the point. His desire uh, in saving us is that we would progressively grow closer to him. You would get on that process uh, of, of uh, sanctification and that we would become more and more like him. He made us in his image and in his likeness. We would conform more to him than we would to the world. Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we're supposed to do. The scriptures are clear about that. We're to become increasingly spiritual and we're to decrease that carnality in our life. Will you have moments of sin? 
Yes. But as you grow in your faith, those moments should get less and less and less and less. The more you conform to the image of God. <clears throat> but until we're delivered from this fleshly body and from the issues in this world, you're going to see some of those uh, ugly things from your past uh, pop up. I call those my BC days. Sometimes I have them every day. Yeah, before Christ, you know. Uh, you know, you, you, you act like that. I tell people that I work with. Now, the other day, the other day, I, I was so upset about something and and I was just going off and talking about some things, and I had to go in the next. I told them then, don't look at me as an example, but <laughs> that didn't get me out of the uh, Hebrews uh, 12, 10 whipping that I got later. And I had to go back to the office uh, the other day, and I said, y'all know, I said, man, I'm so sorry. I said, I was not acting right. I said, it wasn't a good example. They said, oh, you know, everybody has one of those days. I said, no, 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 no. You can't, yeah, we do, but you can't think like that. Uh, I said, because God gave me a butt whooping whether I could have one of them days or not. Uh, like the, do we have those days? Yes. Is it the expectation that you have those days? No. The expectation is none. Okay. But he delivers punishment, and I'm thankful for it. For a genuine believer in Christ, you know, again, those outbreaks should be the exception, not the rule. You may lose your temper. You may say things that you shouldn't say, but that should have that been a blip. You should say, ooh, whoops. So, let's look down uh, here. The reason that it appears that Christianity is declining is because there's an ever-increasing number of carnal Christians. I, I, I said that to you earlier, uh, and I think that that is a really true answer to why we see this problem. You see Christianity and our numbers increasing, but it appears like it is decreasing because of the morality issues and the engagement. The reason for that is twofold in my opinion. Although Christianity has experienced rapid growth over the centuries, discipleship has not followed the same track. I've experienced it in my life. All these preachers, and we had this sickness that preachers have become salesmen. That my job standing in this pulpit is, is, is my job performance is dictated by how many people got saved or baptized. You go to a, a, a revival. <laughs> go to a revival. Oh, 25 people got saved last night. Did they? Billy Graham had a lot, a lot of people come down. What percentage do you think of those people were truly saved? Huh? Four percent. Daniel said four percent. Somebody throw out another number. If, huh? Ten. Ooh. Ten. Fifteen percent. We're getting higher. Two. Two. <laughs> okay. We're going back in the right direction, in my opinion. We don't know. We don't know. But I would just, in my experience... I would say it's a lot closer to Daniel and Dennis's number than it was to what Matthew and Mary Beth and them put out. We would hope, right? We would hope that it was more. And, you know, of course, in a Billy Graham event, what he did, it, there may have been an event that where 75% of those particular, I'm talking about the breadth of all of his ministry. I can tell you right now, not every person I prayed the prayer of salvation with has been saved. I have done as best I can to till that soil and to talk to that person, but... They walked away different, all right? And so the thing is that it's not about just punching that time clock, but you, you can, I don't look at the success of my ministry based on how many people I have prayed a prayer of salvation with. I don't know. I don't keep track of that. I don't base the success of my job performance for Christ in this church and how many people I've dunked in this pool behind me. I base it off of the growth that I see in the people that remain. Because there are people that haven't remained. But I, have to, I am the shepherd of the people here and the people that are associated with this church. And I had to look at the, the growth of the folks that God has for me here and those people that I'm in contact with uh, out there. Because you know what my job is? It's in Ephesians 4. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. And my, my job is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. So how best I am preparing you to go out and do things for Christ, that's what I'm looking at. And of course, I want more people to 
sign up. Yeah, absolutely, you want to do that. But guess what? Anybody ever had a training class of people that every day a hundred brand new people come in? Wouldn't that be, you, you know, you got a training class the last six weeks and then you get to that uh, fifth week and now a hundred new people are there and you only got one more week to get them trained up? That wouldn't make any sense to do that. It's better that you, the more you do and the more you train, the more God will send people. The better you are about training people, the more God will send for you to do so. Okay. Our, in our church here, we've seen this. We had two, three, four kids on Wednesday nights and things like that. What, was God just going to send us more that we couldn't handle until we, got the, until we got everything set up right where we could do well with them? Then God sent us a 1,000% increase. And that's the, that's the thing that you measure for me. But I can tell you, I don't measure things based on the amount of people being saved. I look at the amount of people that are going into the process of sanctification and, and that are, it's taking Okay, so it, the issue with number one is in the church, in the world, not just in America, but in the world, we have, we have got all these people to say they're Christians. But we've, and so we've birthed all of these people. Okay, I'm saying that in, in, uh, as an analogy. We have birthed all of these people that are saying they're Christians, but they're still drinking milk. What did Paul say in verse 2? He said, he said to these folks, he said, I gave you milk, <coughs> not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You would think after 200 and, some, and, and, and 45 years almost in the United States of being a Christian nation, that we would have matured by now. Paul wrote this letter to Corinth five years after he was there. How many letters would we have had? What would our letters say? Remember the letters to the seven churches in Revelation? What would our letters be like in the world today? The second reason that we're seeing this decline, what, is, what appears is the false notion that carnal Christianity is an acceptable lifestyle for mature Christians. So it's partly our fault because we birthed all these people that are immature but see, it's become the norm that, oh, it's all right, you can, you can be a Christian and still live like the devil. And that is becoming an acceptable practice. Well, you know, the point is, when I'm standing up here telling you, can you be a carnal Christian? Yes, you can. But you can't be a carnal Christian having been carnal for 50 years. Something's wrong with that, isn't it? That you have not yet surrendered? At that point, if you do make it to heaven, there was going to be somewhere in that process of those 50 years or whatever it was, at some point you truly did surrender and you were only a Christian for maybe a year and a half or maybe for a half a minute, okay? But it cannot be. And I, I did a sermon similar to this years ago and I had right here this long ruler. And the title of that sermon was, It Is mandatory to grow old but it is optional to grow up and that is the way that you have in your in your faith right now i don't it does not impress me that you've been a christian for 35 years that don't impress me in the least i've been a christian for now 20 years and i'm 32 and i can tell you right now i'll stack my christian maturity up to some people that i've seen been christian for 40 years not that I'm trying to be haughty, but it ain't that hard. Have you seen some of the way some people have acted? Yeah, I, that doesn't impress me. It impressed me that you got old. <laughs> Did you mature? Are you on solid food? You talk, I've been a Christian 35 years, you go, wah. I know we round about, get back into diapers and stuff, but it ain't supposed to be like that with your Christian faith. <laughs> but you laugh, but it's true. You know it's true. There are old people that, are that have been Christians, they would say, all their life. How does that happen? How did the church allow it? When they sat in a church under a shepherd. How did that happen? It ain't all their fault. That would be like talking to a baby saying, why didn't you go fix your own food when they're two months old? 
The church has, has, has been derelict in our responsibilities. And, and we, we cry about what's happening in the world. Well, change it. So the question is, if Christianity is growing because it is adding people that are living worldly lifestyles with no intention of repentance, is it truly growing? No. Is the church really growing at 1.27%? No. There are 1.27% more people saying they're Christians, but there are not that many more people that are truly coming into the faith. So what do we do about it? We talk about it, and you can be mad and you know, pound the pulpit and talk about all them people that you see with all those different beliefs that are out there and how horrible they can be to say they're Christians and pastors and believe these ways. But what do you do? And I want to tell you, what really irks me sometimes, and this isn't in my notes, let me tell you what irks me, is when you hear people talk about folks that, that you disagree with, and maybe it may be even political, okay? Because that's what's on my mind, actually. And we'll say, that person, they believe in that. They're not a Christian. How could they be a Christian and believe that way? Read Romans 14. You'll find there's a lot of play in what we believe. Some people in here may believe in a, in a, in a pre-tribulation rapture. Some people in here may not. Some people may believe it's in the middle. Some people may believe it's at the end. Some people may not even believe in it at all. Some people may, in this room today that are Christians may believe that you baptize by dunking under the water, immersion, you sprinkle. Some people may believe you baptize infants. Some people may believe you don't. Some people may believe that, that Jesus died on Friday and rose on Sunday, but some people believe he died on Wednesday and rose on Saturday. Some believe that we're in the millennium. Some don't. Some believe that parts of the Bible uh, have been fulfilled. Some believe that there's future things for that kind of stuff to happen. Some believe women can be pastors. Some believe that they don't or they can't. Some believe that you can be divorced and still preach. Some believe that if you're divorced, you cannot. Hmm. So who are we to judge? On particular, can a person believe in abortion and still be a Christian? Yes. I went ahead and answered that question for you. You shake your head, Derek, but the answer is yes. Sure you can. Why can't you? It's a belief. You can't, you can't live in giving abortion every day. People believe in all different kind of things. How long can that person believe in that? At, at what stage of sanctification is that person at? But automatically believing in abortion makes you a non-Christian? And, and yeah, I put out a controversial issue. You would say a person's at stage two of their sanctification. There are people that believed all kind of things in the, in the Corinthian church. And they were not there yet. But the only thing that makes you a, a truly carnal Christian is for you to be practicing a sin every, every day or all the time without repentance. It has nothing to do with whether you believe in something or not. I, there are people that believe we shouldn't be meeting on Sunday, we should be meeting on Saturday. And they have real reason to believe that the Sabbath was made holy by doing that. And that we're not Christians. They, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Messianic Church, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, would say you and I are not real Christians. Because we're meeting on Sunday. And we do so every week. You must be careful. You must be careful in determining who is and who is not a Christian? It ain't your job. You can examine, sure you can. You can believe all you want to, whether somebody is or somebody is not. But if you think that certain hot button issues that you have in your mind, you can have a person that believes some way that, hey, I'm not homosexual, but people can do what they want to do. You saying that disqualifies you from being a Christian to believe that way? Am I saying it's right for you to believe like that? Good grief. No, I'm not saying it's right for you to believe that way. But what distinguishes somebody from practicing and what they may believe and where is that person on their path of sanctification? You know what I would do if I had a person that believed strongly in abortion and told me they was a Christian? 
I wouldn't say they were not, but I sure wouldn't think they were much, much down the road of their sanctification, would I? So what do we do about it? Matthew chapter 28 is what you do about it. You don't just decree them as being a non-Christian and say, oh, I don't vote for them people and they're going to hell in a handbasket anyway. You do what the Jesus told us to do before he ascended. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And in verse 19, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Stop, don't, don't, don't go no further. That's where people stop, right there. We go out to all these nations, we baptize all these people, we make tick marks down and we say, they're Christian. Look at there, 100 people got saved. Add into the ranks, 1.28% now. We forget verse 20. It says, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, are you sitting here today obeying everything that God has commanded? I'm not standing here obeying everything God has commanded either. I have not reached yet level 10 or whatever the level is of sanctification in my life. But I'm certainly striving to. And there are areas of belief in my life that I have. I don't believe in doing Easter egg hunts. A lot of y'all do. I think that's a really big deal. But Romans 14 tells me very clearly. You, you do what you want to do on a certain new moon day. Okay? There are, there are things that are non-essential that you can disagree on. Whether you can practice certain things now is different. But if you were just believing that somebody else may be able to do something, I don't know. Those things are gray areas. I think you have to be careful. But the issue we're having in our country today is that people are thinking it's all right for you to live like however you want to and to, and to do that for a long period of time and never have an intention of repentance. And I'm telling you that that's not okay. And that's why we're seeing a less effective church. But see, the problem, and I'm going to end with this. The issue that the church has is that we'll jump on bandwagons of, of, and pick out sins and we'll beat people to death over that while we excuse the other things over here. It's the very issue that people had with Donald Trump. They said, well, hey, yeah. people made him out to be a saint. I never did. Sure, he's a sinner. We've had 45 presidents that have been sinners. I've never voted for a person who's not one. The difference is whether you champion it or not, whether you promote it or not. But for you to say, well, yeah, this is God's man. Well, so Joe Biden may be too. And you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth. What the world needs right now is people that rightly divide the scripture. And for you to go out and tell somebody that they're gay and they'll never be able to come to redemption or something like that, or they're a liar, or you tell people, you decree to people that they are not a Christian, you are condemning folks. And that's not our job. If I see that, then it puts a big target on you for me. And I'm not throwing you away. That's going to make me go after you more. And I'm going to try to talk to you and read your scripture and say, come on, you got you to gotta get, just the same way I do for people who believe that you can sprinkle baptism. I think you've got to be crazy when you look at that. The Bible says go in into water. But we can disagree. We can talk about those things. We can iron, sharpen iron. And if we would talk more, if we would look at folks more, and if we would disciple more. And if you think about it, when Jesus was discipling them people, they did not have a clue at what he was telling them. Even the day, the night that he was about to be killed, he's telling them, I'm going away, and they don't know. Thomas, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we even know the way? And he had to tell them. And here you had Paul coming back. You have to revisit people sometimes. You have to follow up, and it takes a lot of work. So, and God uses us 
to be instruments of, of his will in that. So what is a carnal or a worldly Christian? That is somebody who just simply, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of how the world sees it, a carnal Christian is somebody who lives like they are not a new creation. And that is not a true Christian. My submission to you today, and you're welcome to disagree with it, is that you are going to have carnal moments. You will have things that you will find that are wrong, and you will, you will be a sinner at moments. But you'll have repentance. You'll have those things are exceptions to the rule. If you are living today, and you are not repenting of things that are sinful in your life, you can't possibly be a Christian and have no repentance. But you can be a Christian and find grace, but you gotta be careful. Like Romans 6 says, you don't sin just to get grace. So it's complicated, no doubt. But God's love for us is so great that, that, he, that he loved us enough that he sent his son to die for us even though we were, we were still sinners. Let's pray. Father God, I do praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word today. And Father, I just pray that you would help us, Lord, as we are trying to reach out to people uh, all over the world, Lord, that we would uh, look at folks and that, Lord, we would not be in the practice of condemning people, uh, but Father, that we would plant seeds, we would examine folks, uh, Lord, we would look out uh, into our sphere of influence and we would see people that are obviously showing signs, uh, Lord, that they do not know you. And Father, we don't know whether they are or not. All we know is what we see. Uh, but Father, I would pray that you would give us a heart that is like yours, Lord, that we would look, go after people, Father, that we would go after those lost sheep, uh, Lord, that we would know that every single human being on the planet is worthy of redemption. And that, Father God, that you've died for each and every one of them, no matter what they're doing, no matter what uh, they have done in their life. And Lord, there are people in our spheres of influence, Lord, that we look at and we just can't even understand how they could possibly be a Christian and, and think the way they do or, or, or sometimes even act the way they do. Uh, Father, just in the same way as we've already said, that there are people that are dying and going to hell, yet they're showing signs that they are good people. But Father, help us to know our place and, and help us, Father, to be about the, the Great Commission to go out into the nations, to baptize people, and to teach them everything that you have commanded them. And that, Father, that's us planting the seed, that's us watering, but you'll get the increase from it, Lord. Go with us as we leave this place today. Keep us safe and bring us back tomorrow as we have Bible study at 6. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.